we all have similar wounds. You may not act them out as much as Hitler did, but the wounds out of which his actions came are inside of you too, you know, maybe on a, uh, a much more minor level. But to uh, this amazing thing began to happen. This was, for me, was when the O.J. Simpson trial was happening all those years ago, and I could keep my heart open to him. I didn't like him. I didn't like what he had done. But he was a soul on a journey, and this is what his destiny was about. And I didn't need to close him out of my heart. And as far as I can see, that is how our world will be healed. One person at a time meeting themselves, meeting their pain, and then meeting other people's pain in our heart. What Stephen would say is you don't have to let these people into your life. You know, maybe it's somebody that deeply abused you when you were a child. But don't let them out of your heart because you're the one that pays the price. You're the one whose heart is closed. And to begin to open your heart even to the difficult people can soften the armoring around your own heart. So we've talked about the preciousness of life. And we've talked about one of the core things that you can do rather than trying to be present for the preciousness, which doesn't work, you know, is to begin to open, become curious, to get to know the armoring around your heart, the deep reservoir of pain, the places that you turn away from and you turn towards. The other thing you can do is to begin to know that how you were wounded was absolutely perfect. That's why I love the Eckhart Tolle quote so much. Life will give you the exact set of experiences you need in order to become a conscious human being. How do we know they're the right set? Because you are having them. So for myself, of the many, many wounds, I oftentimes say I wouldn't have wished my childhood on anybody, one of the many wounds was a father that uh, was in a competition with his brother to have the first son to get the family name. And, of course, uh, I was the second child my father had, and both of us were girls, and his brother had a boy two months after I was born, and he was a boy. And so my father never even spoke to me. For the 12 years, he had nothing to do with me. Uh, for the 12 years that we lived as a family. And then uh, when we had to go to visitations every other week when I was 12 years old, that was when the sexual abuse started. And in this time where my heart was opening again and I was spending as much time with Stephen Levine as I could, um, I had this dream. And... It was a dream that in the kitchen of the house that uh, my mother and my two sisters and myself moved into after the divorce. And my mother was standing against the stove. And my father was sitting on the ground, you know, leaning against some cabinets. And I turned to my mother and I said, do you know that I am the earth awakening? And she said, no. Then I crouched down. And I said to my father, do you know that I am the earth awakening? And he said, yes. And I said, do you know that you were the absolute most perfect father I could have on my path? And he just started crying, and I cried, and then the dream ended. What did I mean by that? The depth of the wounding that I took on when I was young was so great that I was one of those people that was extremely suicidal for a long period of time and was a drug addict and and so on and so forth. 
And yet that was not my destiny. My destiny was to begin to wake up, to wake up out of this dream of struggle. And I had enough pain that I couldn't just stay half alive. I couldn't just stay pruning the branches of my tree. Life took me down into the dirt. It took me down into where the pain was. It took me down into discovering how to be with my pain and how to again live in the root of my being, in the truth of who I truly am. So I was never the subject of my father's heart. I was always the object of his mind. And yes, it, it, it broke my heart so completely. But it also became the fuel for the lessening of the armor around my heart and my awakening back into my heart. I also want to share with you a story. I'm going to read it from Stephen Levine. And uh, for you that don't know who he is, he wrote many books on death and dying, but he really he, he wrote books on how to be fully alive because he had a uh, the Hanuman Death and Dying Project. And for years, people could call into his house 24 hours a day if they needed help and in dying or a loved one dying or a child being kidnapped. And he sat at thousands and thousands of people at their 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 deathbed with them and it made him one of I mean you know he has the most beautiful heart of anybody that I have ever met the most beautiful practical heart you can have a very beautiful spiritual heart but to actually bring this heart into everyday life that's what Stephen taught me so I want to read you a, a, a story that uh, that he wrote that shows the perfection of our wounding. So here is Stephen. When I was seven, my best friend died. I was born with a systolic heart murmur, a leaky valve, which caused me to tire easily and did not allow me to participate in sports or the heavy play that joined most of my peers. My friend Eric had leukemia. When we met, we instantly tuned into each other. Our play together had a joy I'd never known, a camaraderie and a quality I had never experienced. He was my first real friend. I can remember sitting on the floor of his bedroom, surrounded by toy soldiers in Lincoln Log Fortress, happier than I had ever been in my life. Oh, the room was filled with light. My heart was wide open, and we loved each other. We loved each other. We could hardly wait to get together after school. Then one day, he wasn't in class, and I, after school I ran two blocks to his home only to be met at the door with his weary mother who told me Eric was too ill to play. He died two years later. I was torn apart, bewildered, disbelieving, angry. It couldn't be so. I had at last a close friend, and where had he gone? Who could I turn to? No one understood. My grief and confusion were an embarrassment to my teachers and to my parents. But I just couldn't believe he was gone. In disbelief, going once again to Eric's house, slouched on the lawn, waiting for Eric to come out and play. His mother peeked out from behind closed curtains and then disappeared. I went up on the porch and she met me at the door. Dismayed by my great sadness, she told me that I shouldn't be so sad. Eric didn't die. He just moved away, and I should go home. Oh, you know, just as I read that, I'm just, you know, this is a representation of what we talked about earlier, about how we are all silently 
wounded in so many ways for life and how that wounding is ignored or dismissed or denied. So Stephen goes on to say, for weeks I was lonelier than I ever had been. I felt I couldn't trust anyone or anything, not even life. As the years passed, the valve in my heart healed and I found other friends and loves. I even apparently forgot Eric until almost 30 years later, assisting for the first time in a deaf and dying workshop, listening to the closing comments of parents who had gone through considerable grief work, thinking to myself how lucky I was to have never have lost a loved one. That's how deeply we can, we can bury inside in that reservoir our pain. When all of a sudden, Eric's room appeared aglow with our friendship. I was seven years old again. I was in that loss, the loss of the greatest joy I had ever known. Because I was cracked open, oftentimes I could feel the pain of others in my heart, but it made me angry to be alive in such an anguished world. I couldn't stay open to the suffering I saw around me or the pain within me, and it took me years to allow my heart its vulnerability. My grief had torn me open, and yet until now, I hadn't known what to do with my pain. So that's what we're exploring here. We all have a deep reservoir of pain. And we all run away from it. And it cuts us off from this alive, intimate, wondrous connection with life that we so deeply long for. So, As you hear this, I invite you to ask yourself two questions. What can I bring into my life that allows me to be curious about my pain? And if you don't have an answer to that, you know, it's why I've written books, I have online courses, you know, I have uh, CDs, uh, you know, I have groups, you know, I do this radio show, I write blogs, all with the intention to help us open what has been closed and bring warmth and kindness to what is scared. But the other question I invite you to ask yourself, what can I bring into my life that reminds me of the preciousness of this moment? Off and on for years I have have the insight timer on my phone and, you know, and I'll do it for a while and then it will fade away and then it will come back. But here's this wonderful gong that gongs every 20 minutes throughout the day that reminds me to pause, that reminds me to open to life as it is right now. Or maybe you get some rocks and you get a couple of bowls And you get a little pouch, or maybe you carry it in your pocket or in your bra, this rock that reminds you that life is fleeting, that, you know, Stephen tells the story of a 93-year-old woman on her deathbed that said it can't end now because it hasn't started yet. You know, I told my son the other day, who's 6'2", you used to hug my knees, and I would give my left arm to have just a day with you and your sister again. Life is so precious. And we're so busy usually being someplace else. The third thing I would invite you to bring into your life is to relax into this moment. Life is a constantly changing river. And watch your mind trying to grasp to what it wants and resist what it doesn't want. And all the while, you miss life. So use your breath. Use long, slow out-breaths. 
you know, people say, oh, breathe, you know, but we breathe, you know, 